stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor... And you just don't see architecture like that in Los Angeles. So right away... We started you shooting, and, and it, within that first year, seven of the 12 theaters on Broadway's closed. And they started making swap meet arenas out of it. used to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is director Mark Kemble, and author Jacqueline Winspear. Director, playwright Mark Campbell was born and raised in Rhode Island. He went to Colgate University and Providence College. You finished with a degree in English, or you majored in English. Were you going to write then? Well, I wrote uh, since I was a kid, really. I used to write short stories and read them to my mom when she was ironing my clothes for school. You're kidding, really? Yeah, yeah she laughed in all the right places, so I figured. <laughs> Maybe I should write some more. Good audience. Yeah, she was a great audience. You know, it's interesting you say that because if she were not a good audience, I don't think I would have pursued it as much. But so she was very encouraging. She laughed. <laughs> which was. But, but the funny thing is you went on to do things that were not laughable. Well, yes, well, sometimes, yes. But she was very encouraging, yeah. The one big thing... Uh, I think that maybe put you on the map was mm. Names, yes. which was about the Hollywood blacklist. Yes. And it seems that all of the things that you've written or that you've been uh, associated with are socially, um, well, have a social message to them. Yeah. Is that right? Well, I don't think I, I get up in the morning and, and, and say I'm going to write that kind of stuff. What happens though, Joan, <laughs> over the years when you write, and I've been doing it, I guess, 25 years now, certain things stay with you or they don't. And certain projects get under your skin, and uh, things that have social re relevance get under my skin, so I, I stay with them, because it takes a long time to get to the finish line with, when you're writing something. Well, you started on, with names in, what, 95? Uh, no, actually, I started writing names in 1980. Oh, you did? But and it was, then it got... It was produced in 1995. Oh, so it does take a long time. Do you keep changing things? or do they, Yeah, sure. Do, yeah. Do, um, New research comes in, but also at the same time, you know, it doesn't have to take 15 years. But, uh, you, but it went off Broadway. It, it went, started here. It started at the Matrix in Los Angeles, then it went off Broadway at the American Jewish Theater very successfully. Then it came back and revived two years ago at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. Adam Davidson directed that production. And Adam Davidson won an Academy Award. He did for Best Short Film, right? Lunch Date. I think Lunch Date was And did, is that how you got him to direct your piece? No. <coughs> I, uh, I, I directed the first, I directed Names at the Matrix in 95 and also in New York City. And then when it got revived, uh, um, uh, I like directing my shows, the, fir the first productions of my shows. But then again, after that, the revivals I, I, I give to other directors. Um, he, oh, he, so he, yeah, he came recommended by David Strasberg. Uh, so I didn't know Adam before that. Yeah. But Adam's father is a director. Well, Gordon Davidson, <laughs> yes, of course. But, right. And then you went on to work, or were you working with Gordon at the time at no, the Taper? No, I was at the Taper in 19, hmm, I think 91 to 93. Uh, and under the uh, what's called the Mental Playwrights Program, the oh. inaugural program, Oscar Eustace ran that, who now runs Trinity Square in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh. And it was ten writers chosen to uh, work for two years with uh, great playwrights who came and, and taught us uh, and, and, and mentored us. But that uh, was a great program, wasn't it? Fantastic for me because it was four times a week, five hours a day. It was very, very intense. And what did they do with you? Well, it depends. Um, what would happen is every every week or two we'd get a different playwright uh, to come through and they would teach us, uh, not teach us writing, but they would run us through exercises and uh, talk about writing from their point of view. And then you wrote. And then we would write. We would write every day. Yeah, right. So it, names actually came way before that. Oh, yes. yes. And then it's being made into a film, I it understand. It is now, yes. Uh, Gene Domanian in New York City, who produced quite a few Woody Allen films and also produced The Spanish Prisoner, uh, uh, yeah, got the, the rights to it. David and, uh, Mamet? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, got the rights to it in. Uh, and is producing it as a feature film. I wrote the screenplay for it, yeah. Do you keep your little fingers in there? Are you there watching what's going on? I mean, when it's actually produced? Well, it has, it's not in production, so, but I've made, uh, co-produced and co-written two films, independent films, and those two films, I was there from the idea through distribution, but when you're, when a script is bought from you, it's less likely that you're included in that way. So you I mean, you're asked questions and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're given some, uh, lip service prominence, but it's it's their ball to run with, you know. Is that what happens? Well, the director, the director in film gets a hold of it. It has to be his thing or her thing, yeah. We talked about social re relevance. Mm -hmm. One of the things was uh, a film that you 
Did you write it, Facing Fear? Facing Fear uh, was a family film, but race was a political satire. That was a more socially relevant. It was about a city council race in Los Angeles between a, a black CCH pounder and a Latino, Paul Rodriguez, and they have to get the white vote to win, who was Cliff Robertson at the time. That was a cable film for HBO. And then Snow Soldiers? Snow Soldiers is a feature film that we've just completed and put out. Um, uh, it's in development uh, as a major feature film. Um, it's about the 10th Mountain Division in World War II, this elite group of uh, bright kids from, uh, from the northern schools who could ski, and they made into an elite group uh, and had to get the Nazis out of the uh, Italian mountains at the end of the war. Do you yeah. go to those areas when you're riding? Well, sure. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean I, I did don't, you look, go to the mountain? I, I, we didn't go to Italy, no, but we <laughs> went to Colorado where there's a museum dedicated to uh, the oh. 10th Mountain Division. Um, a really great group of people uh, who uh, actually had the highest casualty rate per capita in World War II. They had to um, they had to go up the mountains in Italy and, at the end of the war and get the Germans out of there. And then how do you find? How would you come across something like that? Did someone well, tell you? Well, it's interesting. You? No, my partner Tom Muska, who who uh, wrote and produced Stand and Deliver, among other things, oh. um, happened to be at a film festival in Colorado and saw the museum there. I said, "What an interesting story!" Oh, we just went to the museum. He just happened to see the museum. He said, "This would be an interesting story." So three years later, we have the script. So it was an interesting story. Yeah. The other thing. Um, you did um, Disputation. You right. wrote a stage adaptation. Right. What is that? What's the well, difference? It's, it's strange because uh, usually uh, a play will go to film. But in this case, it was a one when hour. A play, a play goes to film. A play will and then go to do film. You, do you write it or does somebody else take it over once you've written your play? It depends. If, oh. you, if, if they want you to write it, you write it. If they don't want you to write it, well, I've always written any, any so kind that's of your thing. screen adaptation, is that right? Well, no, the disputation was the opposite. It was a one-hour Channel 4 film written by Chaim Maccabee, a Jewish scholar, and I made it into a two-hour play. Oh, you made it into a, a two-hour play. play, right? Which ran uh, Los Angeles, London, and New York. Uh, oh, well, yeah. that's that's totally. It's just the opposite. Yeah, you how it usually goes. Yes, yeah. Now we're. Um, Talking about your directing, have you directed films? I haven't directed film. I'm directing my first film in the next 12 months, something I've written um, in Providence, Rhode Island, will be, will be shooting. But you, I've directed plays, yes. Yeah, you've that. directed plays, yeah. I know, because I've, I've yes. seen some of the yeah. work you've done. Um, right now at the um, Strasbourg Theater, we have A Comfortable Truth, yes. a, boy and a, a story of a boy and his priest. Yes. And that's extremely volatile. Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. I think that your direction has been incredible. Tell you us saw the show, yes. I yeah. saw the show, yeah. and I saw the way you moved people around, yeah. and, and there's a lot, there's, well, how many, four or five people on stage? There's 11, actually. Is there? Well, because there's six altar boys. Oh, I forgot about right. them. They're always coming and yes, going. Right. I forgot about them. Because the main five, characters the five are leads. Yes, so right. strong. There are yes, five people. Yeah. And then Juan Carlos Malpelli did the Beautiful set. Beautiful set. Incredible set. Yes. So you really feel like there's a huge stage. Yes. And yeah. all this action going it's on. true, yes. So yeah. how'd you do it? <laughs> well, how do you do something like that? Well, we got long rehearsal time. I did script development. I got script development with the actors because I was also writing, of course, writing and directing, so I needed a lot of time. And uh, I had a great cast. I mean, you can't beat a cast of, of great professionals like Alan Blumenfeld, Paul Lieber, Shereen Mitchell, Zach Graham. Um, uh, who Greg Malavy. Greg Malavy. How can you forget, forget Greg no, Malavy? He's he was fantastic. So yeah. great. He's fantastic, yeah. And it's a very dicey subject about a priest who not only molests a young boy, but actually seduces the mother and father also. I, I saw it, and I've read these stories, and yes. I know how, how emotional they are. Yeah, yeah. But there was so much emotion. I felt like you put everything into that one family. Yeah. Is, do, have, have those situations actually Well, let me tell you like what that? happened. I've talked with SNAP people. These are survivors' uh, network of those abused by priests. Um, and there was one woman who was uh, molested by a priest. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, one man who was molested by his priest. And his mother was molested by a different priest. Oh, so I see. So I, I, you know, I metaphorically pulled it all together that it actually happened on November 22nd, 1963, the day Kennedy was shot. He, he molested all three of them in one day. And also that had so much to do with the Catholic yes, feeling and the, the reverence. Right. And, and, the loss of, and the loss of innocence in our country at that time, the right. loss of innocence because of this pedophilia and stuff. So there was, right. there was sort of um, a conscious image uh, choice on that kind of thing, yeah. What style of directing do you use? I mean, would you direct another play the same way that you No, of course this? not. No, no, I directed Names, and Names is a very conventional sort of setting. It's a hotel room at the Algonquin Hotel, and there's certain things you can do. The reason I, I directed this and I wrote it the way, I wrote it in a sort of a surreal sort of thing. There's no 
no real place. The time is 63 in 1974, but the place is really in your imagination. It's an oddball kind of place. So you have room to play around theatrically, which I wanted to do with the altar boys, uh -huh. the chorus, and stuff like that. Because this. they're moving. They're almost yeah. like narrators. They are. They're witnesses and narrators. and, and Witnesses. Uh, yeah, they're witnesses to the events, and they're, uh, they're the abused children. And um, uh, I wanted to implement them, and I wanted to also um, have a, a, a continual flowing uh, of events from 63 to 1974 without any I didn't, want, I didn't want a conventional situation where you have a psychiatrist's office and there's books on the wall and maybe people come in, they knock on the door, they um, say, I'm here for my therapy. That's it's, why the it's set boring was, to me. That's why the set was so good. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes. It looks like some kind of odd train trestle, bombed out church kind of Yeah, it was very thing. bombed out. Yeah, there's like yeah. piles of trash, trash and, and stuff. And, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. way the um, clothesline came the down. The clothesline slipped <laughs> down. Yeah, yeah, altar boys up in the rafters dropping snow when it was supposed to be yeah, snowing. Yeah, that was wonderful. So was that all your idea? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, who else could it be? I wrote it and directed it. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like you sit there and you go, how could all this be happening? Because yes. a lot was happening on stage. It is a lot. It is a lot going on, yes. Right. <laughs> how right. could it be anybody else? I don't know. I'm going, look, sawdust. Yeah, They're sawing and sawdust I, I know is coming it. I know down. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. But one of the things um, is the psychiatrist seemed, he didn't have the major role, but he seemed like he was in the major role. Well, because he's on stage most of the time. Is that? Yeah, that's what it is, really. And, and at the same time, you have, a, you have a guy who really wants to find out the truth of the situation. But often in life, you will find, and even very bright people, that they're, they're hired to find out the truth of the matter, but they bring their own truth to it. They're looking to really prove what they already believe rather than to find new evidence of something. And he was hired by the church to find out. I was just going to yeah. say and that. And he was also Catholic himself. And he wanted to find out the truth, but he was resisting finding out the truth at the same time. But then you wrote it so that everybody could find a comfort in what was happening. Well, you hoped. Yeah, I mean, you hoped. Yeah. I mean, it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be, but it was very uncomfortable, of course, at the end. It because, was very uncomfortable. Yes, yes, but the yes. other thing is, once they have to face the truth, that becomes very uncomfortable. It is very uncomfortable. And yeah. I spoke to um, Shireen yes. Mitchell, who is the it one... Played Mrs. Gordon, yes. Plays Mrs. Gordon, and it's the play is dedicated to To Pamela her. Gordon, an actress who died a year ago, and a very good friend of mine who was a great theater actress in Los Angeles. Oh. She helped me develop this play over the years. So you made her the, her, her, the I, title I, I, was... I gave her the name because in future productions it'll always be Pamela Gordon, which I, I wanted to dedicate that oh, to her. Oh, that's wonderful. I wondered why that was yeah. the dedication. But also Shireen said when she finished, she's so exhausted. Yeah, she is, yeah, yeah. And I would yeah. imagine everyone else is exhausted. Yeah, they are. It's an exhausting emotional play because, um, you know, she has a whole scene there where she's under hypnosis and she comes to terms with this molesting of her child. And she also, the child told her he was being molested and she has that guilt and she was also molested by the priest. She has that guilt. Which so, she never divulged to anyone, and then all of, of a sudden course, it all comes exactly. out. Exactly, and the husband was also involved with the priest, and he never divulges that. So, you know, um, it's a very um, difficult uh, play for actors to, uh, to engage in because it really takes every inch of their, their talent and their emotional investment, yeah. Do you have to be there every night? I don't have to be, but I am for the most Are part. You? Yeah. Do you do you rework things as the play is going along? I try I try to rework things, but you have to understand that I rewrote many times during the rehearsal process, and the poor actors had to keep on relearning their cues. So I wanted to run for about two or three more weeks. When we extend, I'll take about a week break, and I'll do some rewrites on it. And yeah. then, uh, as your other plays, would do you think it'll go to Broadway? Off I don't Broadway? know. Uh, I'm going to go to Providence, Rhode Island, and do it first, oh. probably. Maybe even London, and then New York. That's what I, I hope to do because I have a network developed in, in Providence and London. So we'll see. Um, you still have close ties to Providence. You went to school there. You were born there. You yeah, live there. You living, still have that accent. Is it really still there? That's <laughs> still whole, there. Let me tell you, it's, it's, it's not really as much as you uh, as it could be because most of the time it's, it's more like over here, like this here, like that there. It's, really, it's more up in the nose. It's when you go there, home, so, when yeah, you go home, do they talk like that? It's very fast. It's very up there like that there. So it's like, oh my God. But, but it, also, if you if you had a little bit more Irish accent, you, you'd look like Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, I am. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. well, it's better than looking like Bozo the Clown, I guess. But, you know, I, I, I am. Good. I'm also black Irish. He's black Irish, so we share that the nose and the forehead and the hair. So and the eyes. And the eyes. Well, yeah, his <laughs> eyes are blue. That's not so bad. Um, you know, it's funny. I was in the airport one time, and a woman came up to me, and, and she said, "Kaiser Sozi." I said, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> 
Okay, I never, I had not seen the usual suspect. She goes, come on, you, 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 this is just That's after, all she could remember, this right? This is just after I had a very difficult time in New York developing a different play, and I was on the plane back to Los Angeles. I was feeling like crap, and she said, Kaiser Sosa, you're, you're, you're Gabe, she said, you're Gabriel Byrne, the actor. I said, no, I'm Mark Campbell, the tormented. The a, I'm so tormented. a big difference. <laughs> We're going to let you go with that torment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know, it's so great that you can laugh about all this oh, stuff. Gosh, yeah, what can you do? I mean, we're not curing cancer here, right? Yeah. We're entertaining and, and maybe getting a little art out there. And you certainly are. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it, Joan. Thanks, Thank you. Mark Kimball. And don't go away. We'll be right back with author Jacqueline Winspear, who wrote, here we have it, Maisie, Maisie Dobbs. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with author Jacqueline Winspear, who was born and raised in Kent, England. She studied at Cranbrook, the University of London Institute of Education, and in England she worked in publishing and marketing. But Jackie came to the U.S. in 1990 and um, started writing. But did you start Publishing first? Were you working in publishing here? Uh, y yes, I was actually. And in fact, even in the UK, I was working in uh, I could in, in publishing for a US company. But, oh, you uh, were. Yeah, but um, I wasn't in the the glamorous side of publishing. I worked in academic publishing, which you know for universities, colleges, and so on. So it's very different. So so really different. textbooks, textbooks, <laughs> textbooks, <laughs> software, <laughs> that kind of thing. Really? Yes, yes. For a long time. Um, yes, quite a long time. And then something. Seemed in your bio said so you, when you came here it was personal and business uh, coaching. What was that? Yeah, well, um, I, I, I have a business background, obviously, working in publishing. I'd also worked in education in England, sort of bringing that together, um, and uh, marketing in education. So when I first came here, I was based, I worked in uh, publishing. Did the publisher bring you here? Uh, no. Or why did you no, come? Why did I come? Um, because I wanted to change. I wanted to live in America. And so I came Don't here. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I went to, my brother was living here, and oh, I thought, so. you know, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. And I had been here a lot, though. And you actually moved to, a, like, a writer's community, a very artsy community in Ojai, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, we haven't lived there that long, though. Oh, We've lived there oh. about a year now. Oh, but don't you find it... Um, it it's a very artistic community, very uh, creative. It's on the edge, very kind creative. of, I think. I love yeah, it. Lots it's, of when you, you feel like there's really some energy going on. Oh, there's definitely energy going on. So yeah. is, but g go on, the personal, the consulting, oh. because I thought maybe you were a trainer. A, a, as a, in a coach, like uh, a, like a, at the gym. Oh, <laughs> I need one of those. <laughs> no, it's a it was something that um, I sort of went into round about 1995. At the same time I, as I was really doing my writing. Well, how um, does and one? It's, and it was it's to do with um, you know working with people basically to make their. I know this sounds really sort of airy fairy, but to make their dreams come true. Is that right? That's yeah. what a coach yeah. was doing? Yes, kind of. That's coach? one way of putting it, yeah. Well, then who coached you to make your dream come true? You wanted to be a writer, I guess. Yeah, well, that was the, that was the little thing on my shoulder that was nagging me. You know, it's what I wanted to do all my life. And I have always, like a lot of people, I've always written. But oh, I yeah. had never struck out um, to be a writer, um, you know. So, so what, how does a writer become a writer? As close to publishing as you were. Um, and that, that, that can be a big turn off because you see the other side of the business, you know, and you think that's never going to happen to me. Um, well, let me just quote one of my friends that when I told her that, oh, what I really want to do is be a writer. And she said, well, you know what you've got to do, don't you, Jackie? And I said, well, what's that? And she said, you've got to sit your behind on a chair and stick your fingers on a typewriter and you have to write. And if you're going to be a writer. If you're going to be a writer. And, and what that means is, is you do have to write. You have to show up at the page every single day. How, phys how uh, do you physically write? Do you sit at a, uh, at a computer or do you I use, a, I use a laptop. But, you know, sometimes when I'm just sort of uh, working out ideas, I'll write longhand. And, and I know this sounds funny, but I love writing with fountain pens. Uh -huh. So I, I use different pens and, and things, you know, that and... I, I like the nice grip of a big pen. And, so, <laughs> and, and you're actually putting something there yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So you have to write. 
Yes. So when you started writing, did you start writing your first novel, Maisie Dobbs? No, no. Oh, I actually, no. <laughs> no I, I actually, I, you know, when I really got serious <coughs> about writing and wanting to be published, um, I oh. knew that, you know, I had to go for sort of a niche that I knew something about. So I started writing on international education. Oh, and, is that right? And I still write on assignment for um, some magazines on that very subject. Oh, is it uh, a little boring? International <laughs> education? <laughs> Actually, you know, it's, it might sound dry, but it's not actually. You know, it's, it's so different from what Maisie does. I know it is. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's interesting. I get to talk to some interesting people. <laughs> like, oh, that's it. Yeah, that is. and and I've I've also written a lot of uh, personal essays and had, uh, you know, I started to like really opinion branch pages out. for the opinion um, pages? more sort of first person type, uh -huh. you know. Um, but uh, and had some pieces recorded for um, actually KQED radio in San Francisco, uh -huh. that kind of thing. Yes. Maisie was actually my first ever fiction. Oh. I've never written fiction before. Yes, but you take Maisie, you put her, Maisie Dobbs, um, you put her in a period. Mm -hmm. So you you really had to create a, a world for her. It wasn't something you were familiar with. No, it's, no, definitely not. It was creating her world and uh, I suppose in a way uh, creating Maisie and her world almost brought together a, dare I say, a perfect storm for me in that um, I'd always been interested in that era, the 1920s, 1930s. And I, then you flash back to even earlier. World War One. yes. It's, uh, that the roots of the mystery are in World War One, and I, I, I do have an interest in that as well. And then how about writing a mystery, from education writing to a, a mystery? Um, yeah, that was that was interesting, but I always knew it was going to be a mystery. Oh, you and did? It, yes, absolutely. It was just uh, there was too many questions, so it had to be a mystery. The, the, the thing with the wonderful thing is that you were just nominated for an Edgar Award, that's which is a Mystery Writers Award. I mean, that's one of the top things a mystery writer can get. I know, I know. And, and here you are, starting out with Maisie Dobbs and taking her back to World War One. Mm -hmm. And um, why should we like her? Why should you like her? Well, here's why people tell me they like her. That, that she is very engaging. She is, she's like a lot of people we know. She has those same questions. She has a lot of questions that are not like anybody that we know. But she has, she's been through things that people go through. She has seen tragedy. Ah, she see. has had to overcome something to get an education to be where she is today. And I think a lot of people really identify with that, that yearning, that longing. That got to that point, her education and mm -hmm. her self-didactic, mm -hmm. she was a self-didact, I guess, mm -hmm. and then her, somebody helped her. She had a mentor, she had a mentor. couple of mentors. Uh -huh. And then she gets to this really interesting job like a sleuth, I mean yeah. like a, a private investigator. Well, it, it, it didn't just sort of come out of the, out of the blue as a, a, if you will, um, an advertisement. Her mentor, um, a very interesting man, he's a, a philosopher, a doctor, um, he's a doctor of forensic science and he had, uh, he, he, that was his work. Did you know this doctor? Did anyone like him? No, I've never <laughs> met anyone like him. I just wonder because all these characters are so well defined. Mm -hmm. Did you go back to England to? Yes, I did. I, to, to, yeah, I wondered if your research started. Um, I spent, uh, I went a couple of times to the Imperial War Museum in London. Oh, yeah. And they have across, their, across the river, right? Yeah, uh, yeah that's across the, uh -huh. uh, across the river, across, across the water. The river. <laughs> <laughs> and Not it's very in, far, but it is yeah, great. Yeah. It is. It's in, it's in Lambeth. Um, and it is, uh, actually I don't know, not a lot of people know this, but it's actually housed in the building that was the original uh, Bedlam uh, Lunatic Asylum. Oh, it was? You know, the Bethlehem. Uh -huh. It was obviously shortened to Bedlam. And, uh, and now the archives are actually in what was the, the chapel. Uh -huh. And uh, they have an amazing archive there of letters, documents, um, pertaining not only to the world wars, but other wars. And uh, there, there's... It, it is an amazing resource for a oh, writer so you did. of that period. So I spent a couple of days there and I also walked every single street that Maisie had to walk in London because it wasn't any good me getting a map because London changed dramatically in the Blitz. Oh, I was wondering about that yeah. because things were, I, I mean, you it's had bombed. to be living um. Mm -hmm. during that period. I mean, mm -hmm. you wrote during that period. Yes, did exactly. You, did you find magazine articles or did you find different um, things that actually put you in those places? Uh, you, you know, I drew upon my parents' memories, actually. Oh. They were kids, you know, before, children before the war, but they remembered a lot of, you know, 
this road went to that road and this was oh. called, originally called that because, you know, after the bombing when roads were rebuilt, you know, they, it didn't look like it did before the war, put it like that. I'm going to hold this up because um, this was on the bestseller list, San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles. That's right. And it's, it's a really great reading and easy, you know, it's like you want to just keep Thank reading you. once you do it. But you've, you've written another book about Maisie. You're doing a series That's right. of things. And yeah. so Maisie's a perfect person as an as a, um, investigator because mm -hmm. she can have all kinds of stories. Will you take her all around the world or will you keep her in England? Um, I, I don't know that. I don't think I'll take her all around the world, <laughs> but um, she, uh, in the next book, she's going to cross the channel. The no, book number three that I'm working on at the moment, she's going to this cross book, the channel. This book, what did she do in this book? Uh, she's she's mainly she's in England. She's in uh, London and in Kent and also in Sussex in the town of Hastings. What's the name of this one? Birds of a feather. And uh, in this book, uh, what's oh, it's still in the twenties though, right? Uh, this is actually in nineteen thirty. In this, so yeah. Can we make her old? Can we, can we age her as she goes along? We'll see. She's, she is getting older. This, again, has its roots in World War I, and that is a hallmark of the, uh, the series, that there is a Is it going to continue connection. that? All? Yeah, the, the, the roots of the mystery are in World War I, and uh, that is, is, in fact, Maisie's challenge because she has memories of that time because she was a nurse in World War I, and that keeps coming back almost to haunt her, if you will. Oh, so no matter what? she takes on as the, the, a client there's going to be some maybe yes relationship. <laughs> some some little relationship to it to that time you know all world wars take a long time to get over and uh, i think that's one of the things that shows up in in Maisie Dobbs's work is this published in uh England? It's being published in the United Kingdom this year. Oh. Macy Dobbs, yeah. It's been and will published. you go do some press for it? Uh, most probably. They don't go in for big author tours like they do here in the US, but uh, I'll definitely be going to England at the time of publication. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't miss it. I know. That's so <laughs> exciting, it. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Well, we're really happy that you came to see us today. Thank you. Thank and you. we love, I, I started reading it last night and I was going, oh, this is no wonder this is so exciting. And then when she goes back, into mm -hmm. like 1917 and mm -hmm. and you follow around in this huge house where mm -hmm. she lived it's yeah. very she's a very unusual character and uh, certainly I'm finding out more about her all the time oh that's great <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much Jacqueline Winspear and thank you all for watching the Joan Quinn profiles keep writing to 777 South Figueroa 44th floor Los Angeles 917 and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.